Okay, we back out on Staten Island. Let's not waste any time and get right into this one. 2009. A shooting in New Brighton that left a Port Richmond man dead and his Mariner's Harbor pal wounded may have been retaliation for the slaying of a reputed Mariner's Harbor drug dealer the week prior. Kai Meek Sears, 24, of the 100 block of Heberton Avenue, was found dead in a white Lexus on Yale Street in Mariner's Harbor after being shot several times shortly after midnight. McKee, 23, of the 300 block of Grandview Avenue, was taken to Richmond University Medical Center, West Brighton, with a gunshot wound to the arm. Police described McKee as a Bloods gang member and said he was in stable condition. Initially, neither McKee nor the third man in the car, Andre Scott, of the 100 block of Heberton Avenue, cooperated with investigators. Sears and McKee were shot at York Avenue and Van Tile Street around midnight. With Sears gravely wounded in the front seat and Scott sitting in the back, McKee sought help by driving to a location on Yale Street, where a relative stayed. Allegedly, Sears and McKee were likely shot in retaliation for the shooting death of Jermaine Dickerson, also known as Big Den. Later, A. Kim Webster, a.k.a. Buddy Lee, would be named as the killer. Multiple sources describe Big Den as a drug dealer with ties to the Bloods gang as well. But if you know, his story is a little more than just that. In fact, Big Den is considered a Staten Island legend and was the leader of GKB, the gangsta killer Bloods. He had been putting in pain and getting money since the 90s. If you ever watched our Wu-Tang story, you would be familiar with the Christian Brothers. The Christians organization was under the gangsta killer's Bloods banner until the murder of their leader, Big Den, at which point they moved under the Valentine Bloods banner led by Anthony Britt. Following their June 2011 indictment, Britt flipped and was one of the star witnesses at the Christians' trial three years later. As for Big Den, he was gunned down during the early morning of November 7 that year, 2009. It happened in front of 55 Holland Avenue in the Arlington Terrace Apartments complex. Let's do a little background on the murder. During the early 2000s, Don's and Derek sold drugs in Staten Island. Derek joined the Gorilla Bloods gang, a set within the Stone Nation faction of the National Blood Street Gang, while he was in prison. At the time of his release in 2008, Derek was a high-ranking member of the gang and inducted others from his Port Richmond neighborhood, including Don's, Earl Manchin, Anthony Johnson, Elvis Burt and Aaron Thomas. Over the next two years, the gang sold crack cocaine from Derek's house. In July of 2009, a police officer stopped Don's for running a stop sign. Don's had approximately 5 grams of crack cocaine and marijuana in his car and was arrested. On November 6, 2009, Derek hosted two high-ranking members of the Gorilla Bloods Tyreen Harley, a GF or godfather from Brooklyn, and Joshua Demelier from upstate New York. Later that night, they went to a party at an unlicensed social club in the Arlington neighborhood of Staten Island. Members from the Nine Trey Bloods, a different faction, also attended the party, including Big Den, a high-ranking member. At one point during the party, Big Den and other members of the Nine Trey Bloods went to the back of the club to smoke marijuana. Members of the Gorilla Bloods group, including Derek, Harley and Demelier, came to the back area shortly after. Manjin, a Gorilla Blood, introduced Harley to the Nine Trey Bloods as the Big Homie, a high-ranking member of the Gorilla Bloods. After exchanging Bloods handshakes, Big Dan G checked Harley asking him how he obtained his rank, who initiated him and other facts about his membership to see if he was official. Harley answered the questions, but in a cocky and aggressive way. Harley returned to the party, but Big Dan was skeptical about his claimed rank within the Bloods. About an hour later, Harley became angry and aggressive with a woman who spurned his advances. He cursed at her as she walked away and bumped into Elam Gin, a member of the Nine Trey Bloods, causing Gin to spill his drink. They argued and Harley punched Gin in the face. Gin and other Nine Trey Bloods attacked Harley. Other Gorilla Bloods tried to intervene, but Big Den held them off. A second fight broke out when Demelier Sucker punched Diane Nelson, a member of Big Den's group. Nelson and others punched Demelier, who pulled out a gravity knife to defend himself. Nelson then shot Demelier, and the crowd fled the club. Once outside, Harley berated Don's and the other Gorilla Bloods for not coming to his aid. After the party broke up, Big Den and others went to the nearby Holland houses and then decided to get breakfast. As they waited for a car, Don's and Derek, both wearing dark clothing and hoods, approached from the parking lot. They opened fire and killed Big Den. 
Police officers from the 120th precinct were at the social club and responded to the call for shots fired. As they approached the parking lot, a black Mercedes took off quickly, ran the stop sign at Holland and Benjamin, and almost struck one of the police cars. The officers turned on their lights and tried to stop the Mercedes, which turned back into the parking lot. The car stopped for a moment, and Dons jumped out of the passenger side and ran towards the Holland houses. Officers Pina and Aguilo chased Dons, who tripped over a cement stoop and fell, and dropped a silver revolver. The officers handcuffed him and secured the weapon. Dons was wearing a bulletproof military-grade vest. Meanwhile, Don's brother, who was driving the Mercedes, fled from the car with an officer in pursuit. Derek fell from the rear driver's side and dropped a 9mm handgun. Officers tackled and handcuffed him. Derek was also wearing camouflage military-grade bulletproof vests and was barefoot. Big Den was pronounced dead at the hospital. The medical examiner who performed the autopsy removed a bullet from Big Den's body. The NYPD ballistics lab matched the bullet to Derek's gun. On November 15, 2009, in Staten Island, Mackay was driving a white Lexus, in which Sears was riding in the front passenger seat, and Andre Scott was riding in the back seat. A. Kim, while allegedly a passenger in a Ford Fusion automobile rented by his girlfriend, pulled up to the Lexus and shots were fired, injuring Mackay and killing Sears. Mackay then drove to his home at 44 Yale Street, Staten Island, leaving Sears in the car. When the police arrived, they found Sears' body in the car, and thereafter had Mackay transported to a nearby hospital. Scott spoke with the investigating detective, Girolamo Campion, at 44 Yale Street, and told him that he did not see the shooter, explaining that, just as he saw the gun, he ducked down into the car and then heard the shots. When Detective Campion initially interviewed Mackay in the hospital at approximately 2.20 a.m. on November 16, 2009, a coherent Mackay told him that he did not see the shooter and did not see the car from which the shots were fired. During these early morning hours, a warrant was obtained to search Mackay's apartment at 44 Yale Street, from which drugs were recovered. At approximately 3 a.m., another detective received a tip from an unknown confidential informant, identifying both A. Kim and Kyrie Henderson as individuals of interest in connection with the shooting. Detective Campion thereafter prepared two photo arrays, one including a photograph of A. Kim and one including a photograph of Henderson. At approximately 6 a.m. on November 16, 2009, the following day, Detective Campion returned to the hospital after recovering the drugs from Mackay's apartment to see if Mackay could now identify the shooter. Mackay had previously stated that he did not see the shooter, but this time, Mackay identified a Kim from one of the arrays as the one that did the shooting. Mackay, while recognizing Henderson, told Detective Campion that Henderson wasn't there. These shootings was revenge for the shooting of Big Den. Crazy thing is, two days later, Henderson was found dead. He was in possession of a weapon that was ballistically matched to the shootings of Sears and Mackay. Testing performed on the weapon revealed the presence of DNA from several sources, most of which was contributed by Henderson, but which also included lesser amounts of genetic material from others, whose identities could not be determined. Mackay testified at trial and identified A. Kim, whom he had known since childhood, as the shooter. A stipulation was read to the jury regarding the results of the DNA testing on the gun. Other evidence against A. Kim included the ballistic match of the recovered gun to the bullets recovered from the crime scene and the bodies of the victims, documentation with respect to the rental of the Ford Fusion by A. Kim's girlfriend, and records of calls made to and from A. Kim's girlfriend's cell phone. A. Kim's girlfriend, who was an alibi witness, testified on cross-examination that, over the course of the entire night on which Sears was murdered, she may have been sending text messages from her cell phone to A. Kim's cell phone, while both she and A. Kim were inside of her two-bedroom apartment. She further testified that, over the course of the entire night that Henderson was murdered, she had numerous conversations on her cell phone. Records from the cell phone company that provided service to A. Kim's girlfriend revealed that, on the night of the Sears murder and into the next morning, A. Kim and his girlfriend were engaged in numerous telephone conversations on their cell phones and not sending and receiving text messages, thus undercutting the girlfriend's testimony that A. Kim was with her in her apartment over that period of time. Additional records from the same provider indicated that the calls made from and received by the girlfriend's cell phone on the night of the Henderson murder did not involve A. Kim's cell phone. During summation, the prosecutor, in reference to the girlfriend's testimony, rhetorically asked. Coincidence. 
or was something else going on with A. Kim's girlfriend and her phone on the two nights of two separate and distinct murders. Contrary to A. Kim's contention, that portion of the prosecutor's summation did not improperly suggest that A. Kim was guilty of the Henderson murder, which was not at issue during the trial. The telephone calls between A. Kim and her on the night of the Sears murder suggested that A. Kim was not at her apartment and that the telephone calls to and from her cell phone on the night of the Henderson murder may have implicated her as an accessory to that crime. Why was Henderson murdered, was it because he participated in the murder, and A. Kim couldn't afford anyone else knowing, so he knocked him? Don't know for sure. In the end, he was sentenced to 27 years to life. As for Don's, in relation to the murder of Big Den, the jury convicted him of racketeering, racketeering conspiracy, murder in aid of racketeering, conspiracy to commit murder in aid of racketeering, unlawful use and discharge of a firearm, being a felon in possession of a firearm, conspiracy to distribute cocaine and cocaine base, and possession of narcotics with intent to distribute. He was sentenced to life imprisonment on each of the three top counts of the indictment racketeering, racketeering conspiracy and murder in aid of racketeering and concurrent terms of 120 months each, for conspiracy to commit murder in aid of racketeering, and being a felon in possession of a firearm, 480 months for conspiracy to distribute cocaine and cocaine base, 240 months for possession of narcotics with intent to distribute, and 60 months for unlawful use of a firearm to run consecutively. The 60-month term was to run consecutively to the other terms. Dexter received a life prison sentence as well. Usually, I would wrap the story up here, but it's not over. We have to go back to the day before Sears was murdered by A. Kim. Even before that though, let us state a couple of things. On February 9, 2010, there was an indictment charging five members of a Staten Island drug distribution network. They were charged with, among other offenses, conspiring to distribute crack and powder cocaine, and using and carrying firearms in furtherance of their drug trafficking conspiracy. As detailed in the superseding indictment and other filings with the court, the crew sold both wholesale and retail quantities of crack and powder cocaine in Staten Island over the past 10 years, and used violence, and the threat of violence, to protect their trafficking operations. For example, in 2002, Benito DeFonso, a leader of the group, allegedly conspired to murder a witness whom he believed intended to testify against co-defendant Andre Collier, in connection with an earlier shooting. Keep Collier in mind. Anyway, in 2008 and 2009, the crew used members of the Blood Street Gang to protect multiple narcotic stash houses they operated in the Arlington Terrace Apartments. On September 18, 2009, following the execution of a search warrant at a stash house operated by the defendant Diane Nelson, law enforcement agents seized four loaded firearms, two bulletproof vests, numerous rounds of ammunition, and quantities of narcotics and drug paraphernalia. As we stated a man named Andre Collier was a part of this group of hustlers. He would be charged with the murder of Earl Mangin, who we mentioned earlier in the story. Born in Staten Island, Earl spent his childhood years as a model appearing in print ads for clothing stores, Sports Illustrated and Toys R Us, among many others. As a teenager, he enjoyed playing softball in the West Shore Little League. He attended Port Richmond High School. As he got older, he held several jobs, including as a packaging worker for UPS and a part-time laborer with a local home improvement company. His biggest passions, however, were his family, his friends and his music. As a DJ, he promoted events in the entertainment industry and made his own music at home. Underneath all this was his ties to the Bloods. On November 14, 2009, Collier shot Manjin twice in the legs and once in the head on the front steps of Manjin's Staten Island apartment. The murder came one week after the disagreement at the party and one day before the death of Sears. This murder was also retaliation for the death of Big Den, a close friend of Collier. Obviously, Akin was not the only one trying to get back. Manjin was affiliated with the Gorilla Blood Street Gang, members of which killed Big Den. Collier had previously supplied crack cocaine to Manjin and once had a disagreement with Manjin over drug sales, resulting in an altercation in the summer of 2009, during which Collier beat Manjin with a vacuum cleaner. The drug dispute with Manjin was ongoing at the time of the murder, but Big Den's killing provided the sole motivation for the murder, to which Collier pleaded guilty. In the end, Collier was sentenced to consecutive prison terms of 25 years and 5 years, respectively. Both sentences also included a 5-year period of post-release supervision. See, this whole thing was more intimate than what was put on the surface. 
A lot of these guys work together, like Manjin, who was being supplied by the Arlington crew, which Big Den was a part of, as well as being the highest-ranking blood on Staten Island at the time. There was some familiarity between some members of each respective group. As far as the whole Arlington crew thing, there is more to this, we leave it here though for now. But this about wraps it up for this one, and we will be back out in Staten Island soon. But as always, stay low and thanks for watching.